Sicily is the largest island in the Mediterranean. A bridge between Europe and Africa, many empires have battled over it. In the early Middle Ages, Sicily was ruled by the Byzantine Empire. However, by the 9th century, the Byzantines were on the defensive. Muslim powers dominated the North African coast, from which they launched naval raids against Sicily. In 827, the Arabs stormed Palermo. By 843, Muslim armies took Messina. And in 878, Syracuse fell after a brutal siege. Soon, the whole of Sicily had been conquered by the Arabs. Sicily, because of its fruitful fields and strategic location, became one of the most important centers of the Islamic world. Greek Christians still living on the island were allowed to keep their own laws and faith, so long as they fulfilled the required payments of annual tribute. The Arabs cultivated papyrus, citrus, and date palm. Sugar became a major export. Syracuse had been the capital during the Byzantine days, but now Palermo shined as the island's greatest city. Palermo's markets were perhaps the finest in the whole of the Mediterranean, a natural meeting point for merchants from every end of the sea. But by the mid-11th century, Muslim rule on Sicily was in disarray. The Zirid rulers of Tunisia and North Africa were, for a time, overlords of Sicily, but soon the Zirids were weakened by wars with Cairo and a series of invasions by Arab tribes from Yemen. Centralized rule in Sicily fractured. The island's Muslims were divided between loyalists to Tunisia and the descendants of the original Muslim conquerors. Emir battled Emir in a struggle to dominate the island. Meanwhile, the Byzantines regained much of their strength. By 1038, the Byzantines were convinced that the time was right to retake Sicily. That summer, they launched their expedition. It was commanded by the greatest Byzantine general of the day, a giant of a man called George Maniacus. One chronicler describes the general dramatically. His voice was like thunder, and his hands seemed made for tearing down walls or for smashing doors of bronze. He could spring like a lion, and his frown was terrible. Those who saw him for the first time discovered that every description they had heard of him was but an understatement. The army led by this bear of a general was equally dynamic. In addition to regular Greek, Bulgar, and Italian troops, it included a powerful Varangian contingent led by none other than the Norse legend Harold Hadrada. Also included was a considerable force of Norman mercenaries. These Normans, young, restless knights from the north who'd begun to ply their trade in southern Italy, had shown themselves already to be formidable warriors. Among their ranks were two young brothers, William and Drogo, sons of a minor lord from Normandy. The weakest link in the invasion force was the admiral of its navy, a Byzantine courtier called Stephen. Stephen was the opposite of George Maniacus, weak, ineffectual, and grasping. Stephen's brother was a eunuch called John, who was the closest advisor to the Empress Zoe and the Emperor Michael. As soon as they landed on Sicily, Maniacus and his motley army of adventurers seemed unstoppable. Messina fell almost at once. By 1040, Maniacus was smashing the walls of Syracuse. During the fighting one day, the emir of Syracuse himself led his army out in a sortie. Young William caught sight of the emir and charged him. As the two clashed, William himself managed to kill the emir. From then on, the young knight was known as William Ironarm. An affable but very disciplined and capable young warrior, William was already attracting men around him. 
but after his exploits at Syracuse, he quickly became one of the leading knights among the Normans. Meanwhile, the brother of the slain emir of Palermo, Abdullah, mustered a relief force in the mountains behind Syracuse, hoping to surprise the Christians at their rear. But Maniacus was tipped off and he moved his army swiftly. It was Abdullah who was surprised when he encountered the Christian army. Bolstered by the fierce Normans and Varangians, the Byzantines won the day, and Abdullah's forces were shattered. Syracuse surrendered at once. Abdullah, however, managed to escape, slipping via his ships past the Byzantine navy commanded by Stephen. Maniacus was furious. He seized Stephen by the throat and howled in his face in front of the whole army. Stephen, humiliated, vowed to get even. It was just in this moment of triumph that George Maniacus, the great general, was recalled to Constantinople under charges of disloyalty. Stephen had contacted his eunuch brother John, who had in turn accused Maniacus of treason in front of the emperor. As soon as George arrived in Constantinople, he was seized and cast into prison without even being given a chance to answer any of the charges brought against him. With George Maniacus gone, the Byzantine position in Sicily broke down almost immediately. The Normans and other mercenaries weren't receiving their wages, and so they departed. Some stories circulated that the Normans and their Italian allies had felt cheated by Maniacus. But whatever the situation, the army quickly fell apart. Almost as quickly as the Byzantines had reconquered key points in Sicily, they lost them again to the Arabs. The Arabs felt that it was a miracle, and they would rule Sicily for the coming decades. The truth of the matter, of course, is that the Arabs were blessed by the sleazy politics at Constantinople. The whole affair reveals a fatal flaw in the Byzantine system of this period. Great men who achieved great things often fell victim to the jealousies and conniving of far lesser men at the imperial court. The real winners of this Byzantine attempt on Sicily were the Normans, who gained not riches, but valuable knowledge. William Iron Arm and the Normans returned to Italy having learned much about Sicily and the Arab forces that ruled it. They now had a good idea of how those Arab armies functioned, and how a successful attack on Sicily might be executed. This would prove to be fateful indeed, as it wasn't the Byzantines who would one day return for another attack on Sicily, but the Normans themselves, and this time, not as mercenaries, but as leaders of their own invasion force. In the 11th century, bands of freebooting, adventure-seeking Normans arrived in southern Italy. Emerging as their leader was Robert of Hauteville, better known as Robert Giscard, the Cunning, a ruthless mercenary turned statesman who eventually gained the title of Duke of Apulia. Back in Normandy, Robert had left a younger brother, Roger of Hauteville. The chronicler Geoffrey of Molitera leaves us a striking description of Roger, calling him a handsome youth, tall and well-built. He was very ready of speech, but his joyous and open manner was controlled by a calculating prudence. Brave and valiant himself, he was fired by the ambitions proper to his years, and he sought by means of lavish gifts and favors to collect a party of adherents who would be devoted to furthering his fortunes. Hearing that his once penniless brother Robert had made himself a great man in distant Italy, Roger determined to join him and see if he too could win fortune and fame. But before departing, he encountered a beautiful young woman that captured his heart and his ambition. When Roger of Alteville met Judith de Evro, the two fell instantly in love. Judith was under the guardianship of her half-brother, a prominent cleric called Robert of Grunmasnil. Despite their attraction to one another, Roger, a landless younger son, would never have been a suitable match for Judith in the eyes of her half-brother. 
Judith was cousin to William the Conqueror, and thus among the highest born of Norman nobility. Still, the two were determined to be together. Roger was an enterprising man, intent on winning for himself a great territory by his sword and his courage. Before departing for Italy, Roger vowed to Judith that he would send for her once he'd gained a principality. Judith promised to wait for him. She entered a nunnery as a novice in order to avoid the many well-born suitors seeking her hand. Thus, Roger of Outville struck out for Italy, where his brother Robert Giscard had recently become Count of Calabria. Roger quickly rose to prominence among Robert's companions, but while Robert's ambition was centered on the south of Italy, Roger became increasingly attracted to Sicily, which had been under Arab rule since the 9th century. Roger led several raids against the island, and by 1061, he and Robert captured the important port of Messina. Roger next established his own fortress of San Marco and obtained loyalty from the largely Christian town of Troina. Meanwhile, back in Normandy, William the Conqueror quarreled with Robert of Grandmasnau, forcing him into exile. Robert Giscard just happened to offer Grandmasnau refuge in the south of Italy. Retrieving Judith from the nunnery, Grandmasnau fled to Giscard's domain, where he became abbot at the monastery of St. Euphemia. Some historians speculate that Giscard had Roger in mind when he offered refuge to Judith's guardian. Judith would not enter another nunnery on her arrival in Italy. Instead, she was reunited with Roger. It had been five years since they were last together, and in early 1062, they were wed at Mileto. Roger's marriage to Judith was yet another stunning achievement for the Outville clan. With Judith beside him, Roger struck out again for Sicily to expand his power base. At Troina, he left his bride in charge of the garrison, while he himself led a force into Arab-controlled territory. But the Norman occupation of Troina had been heavy-handed, and a spirit of rebellion was bubbling among the populace. When Roger departed, the men of Troina, mostly Greek Christians, rose in revolt. Judith and the Norman knights of the garrison were caught by surprise and had to shut themselves up in the citadel. The Christians of Troina obtained aid from nearby Muslims, also eager to rid themselves of the Normans. When Roger received news of what had happened, he rushed back to Troina, only to have his small force beaten back by the rebels. Roger retreated to the citadel with his men, joining Judith in the garrison and being besieged. What followed was a grueling four-month standoff. The men of Troina kept up the pressure on the citadel, and it was all that Roger's knights could do to keep the enemy at bay. Predictably, supplies ran low within the fortress, and eventually hunger forced the Normans to eat their costly war horses. The weather grew cold, and the Normans were weak and shivering within the citadel's walls. Judith and Roger shared a single cloak to keep warm. In contrast to the besieged, the besiegers were well supplied and well fed. During the bitterly cold nights, the Muslim and Greek troops kept warm by indulging heavily in local wine. The Normans in the fortress began to notice that their besiegers seemed less vigilant after dark. Realizing that their attackers were becoming regularly drunk, the Normans developed a plan to overtake them. One night, when the besiegers were noticeably inebriated, the Normans launched a swift attack, storming the town and cutting down their inhibited enemies. By morning, Troina was once again under Roger's power. Norman courage and cunning had snatched victory from the jaws of defeat. Roger was merciless in his treatment of the vanquished. The ringleaders were killed, while active members of the rebellion all received harsh punishments. From this point on, Troina was firmly under Norman power. Roger would use the town as a base for further expansion into Sicily, but for the time being, Roger returned to Calabria for supplies and horses. It says much about Roger's trust in Judith that he once again left her in charge of the garrison. Thus, the Normans have carved for themselves a little domain in a region of northeastern Sicily called the Val de Mone, inhabited mostly by Greek-speaking Christians. However, the vast bulk of the island is still ruled by an Arab emir, Ibn al-Hawas. Based in Palermo, the third largest and wealthiest city in the Mediterranean, Ibn al-Hawas presides over a lavish, powerful Sicilian emirate. Though shocked by the initial Norman successes in the north, he's not about to let Roger overrun his whole island, which has been controlled by the Saracens since the 9th century. Now, Ibn al-Hawas seeks help in eliminating the Norman threat once and for all. He dispatches messengers to Tunisia in North Africa, asking its ruler, Tamin, to send reinforcements. 
Tamman is happy to oblige, for Sicily provides an abundance of wheat to North Africa, which the Emir Tamman is loath to see lost to the Normans. Tamman sends not one, but two armies, commanded by his own sons, Ali and Ayub. Ibn al-Hawas warmly welcomes the North African reinforcements. As the Tunisian troops are assembled alongside the Sicilian army, it becomes clear that this will be a coalition of at least several thousand. Berber warriors under Ali and Ayub make up the largest contingent, while Ibn al-Hawas himself commands a sizable army drawn from the great cities. Ibn al-Hawas knows that Roger's knights are few. He's also aware of the skill and courage of the Normans, but he's convinced that his own large coalition will simply overwhelm Roger's small cavalry. Roger has spent the spring making raids into enemy territory, enriching himself and his men. With their swift horses and heavy armor, Roger and his Normans are formidable indeed, but even more important is their discipline. Roger's men have been fighting together for a long time, and they deeply trust their commander. Roger is a handsome and dashing young knight who easily attracts men to his allegiance. He feasts and makes merry with his knights, but he also fights and rides hard with them. When he hears news of the advance of Ibn al-Hawas and his North African allies, Roger is undaunted. His men are alarmed by reports of the size of the enemy army, which is far larger than any they've dealt with in Sicily. But Roger rouses their courage with his own confidence. They've been outnumbered before, and yet they still conquered. They'll not back down from this battle. The army that Roger assembles in the summer of 1063 is definitely small. He leads no more than 130 knights, including his nephew, Serlo of Outville, recently arrived from Normandy. His infantry numbers little more than three or four hundred men. Roger is careful in selecting the terrain where he will make his stand. He picks a site not far from Troina, some miles west of the river Chirami. Here, he positions his men on the top of an open slope, which will give his knights plenty of space to deliver their charge. Not only will the Arabs have to fight uphill, but they'll be forced to ford a stream. The site is near enough to Troina, however, that Roger's men can make a quick retreat in the event of defeat. Soon, Ibn al-Hawas arrives with his allies. They position themselves across from Roger's knights. For three days, the two armies face each other neither willing to engage. Then, on the fourth day, the Arabs dispatch a raiding force to the village of Chirami. Serlo, leading 30 knights, defends Chirami and repels the raid. Now, the main Saracen force attacks the Norman vanguard, which is personally commanded by Roger himself. The Arabs are hurled back, but they keep attacking. Repeatedly, Roger holds his formation. Serlo, at the head of a small detachment, leads countercharges from the flanks that continuously thwart the charges of the Berber horsemen. By evening, the North African troops are exhausted from trying to attack the Normans uphill. Ibn al-Hawas and the brothers Ali and Ayub agree that nothing more can be done and command their men to withdraw. Roger seizes this moment. With the sun going down and the enemy exhausted, he begins slamming the retreating Arab and Berber forces with repeated cavalry charges. This spreads panic through Ibn al-Hawas's coalition, and the orderly withdrawal quickly collapses into a disordered rout. The Normans aggressively pursue their advantage, mowing down Saracen troops. By nightfall, the Arab and North African forces are annihilated. Roger captures the enemy camp. By morning, the Normans hunt down the scattered remnants of their foes with no opposition. The Norman victory at the Battle of Chirami is incredible. The booty captured is enormous, but the ransoms that come in later from captured Arab aristocrats make Roger and his band of adventure seekers fabulously wealthy. The loss has significant long-term consequences for Arab power in Sicily. Never again will the Arabs launch a large-scale offensive against the Normans. Although for the time being, Arab rule is secure in Palermo and the other great cities of the south, from now on the Arabs will be reacting to the offensive thrusts of the Normans. News of the victory is spreading all over Christendom. Roger himself sends word to Pope Alexander II. 
As they stand before the Pope, Roger's messengers report that on the day of the battle, many Normans swore that they saw St. George himself mounted atop a white charger, riding alongside them as they hurled back the Saracens. The messengers also present the Pope with a gift of four camels, captured from the North African army, much to the amusement of the Pope's court at the Lateran. Alexander II is overjoyed by Roger's achievement. For some time now, the Popes have been eager to see Sicily reconquered for Christendom. The Pope sends Roger a papal banner to sanctify his efforts and offers to soldiers fighting to restore Sicily a blanket absolution. Thus, Roger's Sicilian project becomes something of a proto-crusade, but he suffered from a chronic shortage of manpower. With only a few hundred knights, he maintained his corner of Sicily, but he lacked the numbers to press forward. For the time being, he led his cavalry on regular raids, enriching his knights with plunder and keeping the enemy on the defensive. Although progress was frustratingly slow for this ambitious young Norman, trends were working in his favor. And by the mid-1060s, his men collected considerable tributes from the Saracen towns. After Cerami, the Saracens of Sicily fell into conflict with one another. The Berbers from Tunisia, led by Prince Ayyub of the Zira dynasty, struggled for control of the island with the Emir of Syracuse, Ibn al-Hawas, who rallied the local Sicilian Arabs around himself. In 1067, Ayyub led a Zirid army against a force under Ibn al-Hawas. The result, a total victory for Ayyub, with Ibn al-Hawas dying in battle. Ayyub was now recognized as ruler in Agrigento, Enna, and Palermo. Although he'd vanquished his rival, Ayyub's rule was still vulnerable. Factions within Sicily continued to resist the Berbers, and civil war remained a possibility. Ayyub decided that he could best legitimize his authority by defeating the Normans once and for all. And so, in the summer of 1068, he marched out of Palermo at the head of the largest Saracen army assembled against the Normans in five years. His goal, ambush Roger in the midst of a raid and crush the Normans in battle. One morning, in 1068, Roger was leading a raid to the south of Palermo, the wealthiest city on the island. Suddenly, Roger found his way forward blocked. There, near the town of Miselmeri, an enormous Saracen army was drawn up in battle formation under the command of Prince Ayub. To say that Roger was caught unprepared would be an understatement. But if he was afraid, he didn't show it to his men. Roger had a way of laughing in the face of danger that inflamed the fighting spirits of his knights. He reminded them of their victory at Chirami and urged them to trust in God, who would not fail them. Roger's knights shouted out their eagerness for the fight. By now, these men had been acting together as a unit for some time, and they were confident in their effectiveness in the field. The Normans fell into formation around their leader. Because they were desperately outnumbered, their fate hung on the power and cohesion of their charge. Roger gave the order, and he and his men thundered toward the great Saracen host. With almost a single blow, the Normans scattered Ayub's army. Once the Saracen formations were shattered, the Normans ruthlessly pursued the fleeing soldiers, cutting them down across the countryside. When it was over, hardly a single Saracen remained alive to take the terrible news back to Palermo. But Roger himself found a way to spread the word. Among the heaps of plunder taken from the Zirid camp, the Normans discovered baskets of carrier pigeons. Roger had messages written in Saracen blood tied to the feet of the birds, which were then released to fly back to Palermo. The Battle of Missil Mary was a serious blow to the Saracen resistance in Sicily. Because it took place so near to Palermo, it revealed the capital city's vulnerabilities. Ayub had staked everything on this offensive, and his failure destroyed his reputation. The Zirid prince fled back to North Africa, leaving the Saracens of Sicily in a state of disorder. But Roger was not yet equipped to follow up this victory with an attack on Palermo, which was extremely well defended. Still, he commanded only a few hundred men, and he could not both garrison his conquests and conduct a large-scale siege. For now, Roger had to maintain his position and await the day when reinforcements could be sent by his brother, Robert Giscard, to complete Sicily's conquest. With Miss Ilmeri under their belt, the Normans had racked up a long string of victories over the Saracens of Sicily. This was a remarkable achievement, 
For Palermo was one of the richest cities in the Mediterranean, and the Saracens on the island were well equipped and effective. But the Normans showed a talent for the battlefield that seems to have outstripped virtually all other powers of their generation. They combined quick and cohesive cavalry tactics with cunning, boldness, and a raw fighting strength. The year is 1071. The place, Sicily. Palermo, the largest and most important city in Sicily, has been under Arab rule for some two centuries. Possession of this opulent, strategically central island city has allowed Islamic civilization to dominate the Mediterranean, both militarily and commercially. But today, a new power has arisen in southern Italy. The Normans, Christian descendants of the Vikings, who have spread across the Mediterranean world, seeking adventure and wealth. Under the leadership of the cunning Robert Giscard, the Normans have come to dominate the southern reaches of the Italian peninsula. Indeed, they have just conquered the last great Byzantine city in the region, Bari. The Normans have also captured significant portions of eastern Sicily. Now, Robert has his eyes on Palermo, the great jewel of Sicily. The Muslim defenders of Palermo are aware of this and know that their rule is at stake. Can the wealth and power of Palermo withstand the attack of Robert Giscard and his fearless Norman adventurers? By the middle of the 11th century, Palermo, Sicily, is one of the greatest cities in all of Islam, outshone only by Cairo and Cordoba. Lost by the Byzantines in the 9th century, Sicily has become a focal point of the Arab world and over the last two centuries has been used as a springboard for piratical raids against Christian Italy. But in 1071, the Muslim rulers of Palermo are keenly concerned for their future. Several years earlier, in 1068, they lost an important battle against the Normans at Missil Mary. It now seems likely that the Normans will expand and threaten the wealthiest regions still under Arab control. Those portions of Sicily remaining to the Muslims are controlled mostly by the Zirids, a dynasty of North African origin. Meanwhile, the Normans of Southern Italy have just achieved their greatest triumph. In April 1071, Robert Giscard and his brother Roger of Outfill conquered Bari, the last great stronghold of the Byzantines in Italy. It's a remarkable climax to a journey that began with Robert Giscard arriving in Italy penniless, barely able to feed his own ragged band of knights. But Robert is an unusual man to say the least. His nickname, Giscard, means cunning and is fitting for his character. Now, as Duke of Apulia, Robert is the most powerful ruler in the region. Almost at once after his victory at Berry, Robert begins to prepare for an attack on Palermo. He sends his brother, Roger, to Sicily, while he himself begins to mass his fleet at Otranto. Berry, in particular, will be vital in contributing the navy for the upcoming campaign. Robert has granted generous terms to the conquered citizens of Berry, for he desires their enthusiastic cooperation in the assault on Palermo. Indeed, the expedition against Palermo, in Robert's view, will help to unify his Normans with his new Greek and Lombard subjects. Once enemies, the two camps can at last unite in a battle against their common foe, the Muslims of Sicily. Norman, Lombard, and Greek alike generally view the Arab rulers of Sicily as infidel invaders to be driven out for the good of Christendom. By early August, Robert Giscard joins his fleet at Reggio. Robert's naval force includes 58 ships, manned mostly by Greeks. Robert's Normans board the ships, and the fleet makes the crossing to Sicily. There, they rendezvous with Robert's brother, Roger of Outville, and his cavalry at Messina, the chief Norman city in Sicily. Roger, 
for some time now, has been Robert's right-hand man, although their relationship has often been tense. While Robert is cunning, distant, even arrogant, Roger is gallant and approachable, epitomizing the tall, comely knight who naturally rallies men to his cause. Robert has little use for revelry, but Roger prefers to make merry with his men, drinking hard with them and toasting to their victories. Although these differences sometimes lead to clashes, they're also complementary and have helped the two Normans gain much success together. At Messina, Robert and Roger lay out their plans for Palermo. The attack will be two-pronged. Robert, with the fleet, will blockade Palermo from the sea, and Roger and his horsemen will assault the city from the landward side. But Roger has come up with an idea that he thinks his brother will find most intriguing. Halfway down the east coast of Sicily sits Catania, an Arab-controlled harbor that has at times been an ally to the Normans against the Zirids. Roger's plan is to ride down to Catania, where he believes the rulers will give him a warm welcome. Roger will then request that the Catanians allow Norman ships to use their harbor. If the Catanians agree, Robert can enter the harbor with his vessels, at which point the Normans will then seize control of the city. With Catania secured, the Normans will be more secure in their attack on Palermo, for if it is left in Arab hands, Catania could be used as a launching point for a counterattack against the Norman siege camp at Palermo. Despite past alliances, Robert and Roger can't be sure of Catanian loyalty once the Normans threaten the most important city in Sicily. The conquest of Catania, while arguably treacherous, is undeniably practical and bears the signature of Norman cunning. Robert agrees to Roger's plan, and the operation is pulled off flawlessly. The Catanians are completely fooled, and their hospitality toward Roger results in the loss of their city to the Normans. Robert and Roger bolster Catania's fortifications, installing a garrison to hold the city. Then, they depart for Palermo. Roger, who is eager to visit his beautiful wife Judith at Troina, takes the overland route. Meanwhile, Robert travels by sea with the fleet. It's the middle of August. The Sicilian sun is blazing as Roger of Outville and his army ride toward Palermo. Their rear is protected by Serlo, Robert and Roger's nephew, who played an important role at the battles of Cerami and Missilmeri. Serlo will lead a small force to deflect any Arab counterattacks from the interior of the island. Roger lays camp some two miles east of the city, near the river Oreto, in a region rich in palaces, gardens, and orange groves. There is no opposition. The Normans seize control of the area, taking advantage of the abundant resources. But Roger and his men don't waste time enjoying the luxury. The castle of Yaya sits on the river Oreto, guarding the eastern approach to the city. Roger, who expects his brother Robert to arrive soon, recognizes this point as the ideal landing place for the fleet. Riding up before the walls, Roger taunts the Arab defenders, who emerge to fight. Fifteen minutes later, the Normans have made short work of Yaya's garrison, slaying and capturing all of them. Roger renames the castle for St. John and installs a Norman garrison. Next, Robert Giscard arrives with his fleet, and the Christian ships move to block Palermo's harbor. Robert and his knights join with Roger's army, forming a great arc before Palermo. The siege has begun. The army threatening Palermo contains some 10,000 men, the largest force ever assembled by the Normans of Italy. The defenders of Palermo are ready. For years, they've been strengthening their city's defenses, 
walling up many gates and laying away supplies, they recognize that on their efforts rests the future of Sicilian Islam. For them, this is a holy war for the honor of their prophet and the defense of the Muslims. The fighting is intense. The Arabs of Palermo are hopeful, for in the autumn of 1071, a North African fleet, bolstered by some of the remaining vessels in the Sicilian Arab Navy, appears on the horizon. Robert at once commands all of his men, Normans, Calabrians, Bariots, and Greeks, to receive Holy Communion. Then, the Christians set sail to meet the enemy. The North African sailors put up a fierce fight. They'd canvassed their ships with red felt to repel projectiles. Slowly, however, the Normans gain the upper hand. The Muslims lose many ships, and at last, those that have survived break for the safety of Palermo's harbor. The Norman ships are in hot pursuit as the African vessels enter the harbor. Palermo's defenders immediately close off the port with their great harbor chain. However, Giscard orders his ships to drive forward, and amazingly, the Norman vessels crash through. There, in the port of Palermo itself, the Christians finish off the African navy. The defenders of Palermo are devastated. Disease and famine have begun to afflict the city. However, Robert Giscard suddenly feels pressed for time as well. He's just received news that back in his duchy, on the Italian mainland, a revolt has broken out, led by his nephew Abelard. Giscard is faced with a difficult decision. Should he call off the siege and let Palermo slip from his grasp, or should he fight on and risk his Italian domains? Giscard elects to stay. But he won't sit and wait for famine to reduce Palermo. Instead, he opts for a prompt attack. Palermo's upper town is defended by a fortification known as al Qasar, the fortress. Here, crowded markets enfold an enormous mosque protected by its own battlements. Robert selects this as the site of his attack. Dawn, January 5, 1072. Roger of Outfield dispatches his infantry to assault Al-Qasar. The Muslim defenders rush out through the gates in a desperate counterattack. Initially, the defenders are successful, hurling back the Normans through the raw force of their numbers and their fervor. In the critical moment, Robert Giscard charges in with his cavalry. A single powerful attack from a solid line of Norman horsemen breaks the Muslim defenders, who turn and flee. But as the defenders rush back for the safety of al Qasar, their comrades on the walls slam shut the gates to prevent the Normans from gaining entry. Suddenly, Palermo's most valiant defenders find themselves trapped before al Qasar's walls as the Christian cavalry thunders down upon them. It's one of the more poignant moments in the siege. The Arab warriors bravely meet their end, fighting to the last as the Normans slay them to a man. Nevertheless, al Qasar is still secure. The Normans still locked out. Giscard, ever cunning, alters his approach. With the Arabs so zealously defending al Qasar, he begins searching for portions of Palermo where the defense might be slackening. He finds it in Palermo's lower town, near the quarter known as al Khalesa, the administrative center containing the city's armory and treasury. Here, the walls are more sparsely guarded In a rapid maneuver, Giscard launches an assault. The Norman knights raise their ladders and scale the walls. Quickly, Giscard's men throw open the city's gates, allowing Robert and his main force to rush inside. The defenders at al Qasar 
horrified by the news, jump down from the ramparts and charge toward Al Kalesa. There, in the narrow, shadowy streets, the Normans and the Arabs clash in a final bitter battle. In the end, Norman swords prevail, and the streets run red with Saracen blood. Only a handful of wounded, exhausted Muslims manage to slip back to their few comrades still holding at al Qasar. When the dust settles, the Normans hold the lower town, while the Arabs still hold the upper. As the sun sets, Palermo's defenders come to grips with the harsh reality. They've lost. They've lost most of their men, and Giscard now controls Palermo's armory and treasury. Some want to fight to the death for the honor of their faith, but more practical voices prevail. A delegation is dispatched to Giscard. The defenders surrender. The Normans have won. Palermo, the jewel of the Mediterranean, Sicily's greatest city, has fallen at last to the Normans. In victory, Robert Giscard is merciful. He commands that the lives and property of Palermo's Muslims be respected. The conquered will continue living under their own laws and practicing their own religion so long as they submit to Giscard's rule and pay his taxes. In essence, Giscard grants Palermo's Muslims the same generous terms he granted to the Greeks of Bari. The Norman Duke understands the benefits of benevolence toward a conquered populace. He hopes to encourage loyalty and discourage future rebellion. January 10. 1072, Robert Giscard, along with his brother Roger, his wife Sigilgeta, and his Norman chiefs, makes his formal entry into Palermo. They parade through the city to the ancient church of St. Maria, which during the years of Arab rule had been used as a mosque. Today, the church is reconsecrated as a Christian cathedral. The old Archbishop of Palermo performs a mass of thanksgiving in the Greek rite. This is a momentous achievement. Palermo, held by the Arabs for some two centuries, has at last been brought back under Christian rule. No longer are the Normans mere peripheral invaders, occupying a small corner of Sicily. They now dominate the island. Some portions of Sicily remain under Arab rule, notably Syracuse and Enna, but the Normans seem likely to capture these as well. The conquest of Palermo will have profound ramifications for the strategic situation of the Mediterranean. The Italian ports will be safe from Arab piracy, and the Christians will now project their power across the sea. January 1072. The Normans have just achieved their greatest triumph in Sicily. They have conquered Palermo, the island's most important city from the Arabs. News of this momentous victory causes many neighboring Arab-ruled regions to capitulate, including Mazara in the southwest. Although the Normans now dominate Sicily, pockets of resistance remain. Independent emirs still hold out at Trapani and Syracuse. But most importantly, Arab forces hold out in the strategically central fortress of Enna. Over the past six months, Serlo of Outfil, the nephew of Robert Giscard and Roger of Outfil, has led a small force of Normans in guerrilla operations against Enna, isolating the fortress and preventing its Arab rulers from launching a counterattack. Serlo, who is a knight of considerable skill, has played a key role in the larger battle to subdue Palermo. With Palermo captured, the Normans begin laying out the feudal domains for the island's government. 
Robert Giscard has already been invested as Duke of Sicily by the Pope, but he reserves for his personal rule only Palermo, half of Messina, and the mountainous northeastern territory of the Val de Mone. The rest he hands over to his brother and right-hand man, Roger of Outville, who assumes the title of Great Count of Sicily. Roger will directly hold any territory captured in the future from the Arabs. Serlo will hold a high position as one of Roger's chief lieutenants. But Serlo will not have long to enjoy his newfound prestige. In the summer of 1072, Serlo and a small force of his horsemen are patrolling near Nicosia when they are ambushed by a much larger Saracen cavalry. Seeing that they are hopelessly outnumbered, the young Norman commander and his men climb atop an enormous rock where they make a valiant stand against their attackers. Serlo and his companions cut down a large number of Saracens before they themselves are finally killed. It's a heroic final battle and a testament to Norman courage and valor. When news of Serlo's death reaches Palermo, Count Roger is devastated. Serlo is not only Roger's nephew, but his close friend and comrade in arms. Together, Roger and Serlo had overcome impossible odds against large Arab armies on numerous occasions, winning some of the most important early victories in the Norman conquest of Sicily. Even the stern old Robert Giscard is deeply saddened by the loss of Serlo, widely considered to be the best of the young Norman knights. The site of Serlo's last stand is marked with a great cross and is known for centuries as the Rock of Serlo. During the Siege of Palermo, Robert had been disturbed to learn of a rebellion breaking out in his mainland Italian territories, but he now learns that the uprising has mostly collapsed and his lieutenants in Apulia and Calabria have the situation under control. Therefore, Robert remains in Palermo through the summer of 1072, working with his brother on the construction of great castles at Alcazar and at the harbor entrance at Alcalesa. The brothers also establish a Norman administration and garrison to govern the Saracen population. To maintain a sense of continuity with the conquered Arab regime, Robert gives his Norman governor in charge of the city the title of Emir of Palermo. A few days before he at last departs for the Italian mainland, Robert calls a meeting of Palermo's wealthiest Saracen citizens. He explains to them that the conquest of Palermo had been a most costly affair, especially in expensive war horses. Perceiving his meaning, the Saracen notables at once offer Robert a vast quantity of gold and horses. Robert, satisfied, bids farewell to his brother Roger and returns with his victorious army to his Italian domains. In a life of continuous achievement, this is perhaps Robert's proudest moment. He has gained what eluded both the Byzantine and Holy Roman Emperors, Sicily, or at least the bulk of it. Robert Giscard never returns to Sicily. The final conquest of the island is left in the capable hands of his brother, Roger, the great Count of Sicily. Among the Saracen princes who still rule at Trapani, Enna, and Syracuse, the death of Serlo is held up as a rallying cry for renewed resistance against the Norman conquerors. Roger is more than up to the challenge. Since his arrival from Normandy as a young man, Sicily has fascinated him. He is a lover of adventure, and he's looking forward to shattering the final outposts of Saracen resistance. 
but Roger is also a man of broad vision, and he recognizes great potential in Sicily, situated as it is at the heart of the Mediterranean, and shielded from the turmoil of mainland Italian politics by narrow straits. However, with Robert departed, Roger will have his work cut out for him. With only a few hundred knights under his command, Roger will need to employ his resources carefully. While he plans to isolate and harass the remaining Saracen-ruled outposts, he will pacify and remove any desire for rebellion in the Arabs living under his rule, permitting them to practice their religion and live under their own laws so long as they remain loyal citizens. Indeed, many Saracens prosper under Norman rule and many of those who initially fled to Africa at Palermo's fall returned to Sicily in the first two years of Roger's reign. Meanwhile, Roger encourages Italian and Lombard Christians from the mainland to settle in Sicily. Roger is also careful to cultivate the goodwill of his Greek Christian subjects. Not only does he fully endorse them in the continued practice of their language, liturgy, and traditions, but he personally finances the construction of new Greek churches and monasteries. Beautiful new structures are raised for the Orthodox community, and this attracts many Greek Christians from Italy, including monks from Calabria, who are welcomed by Roger as much-needed reinforcement to the Christian population. Thus, Roger proves to be one of the great early Norman statesmen, skillfully managing a varied Italian, Lombard, Greek, and Arab citizenry. The great count presides over a colorful mosaic of cultures, faiths, and influences that will give 12th century Sicily much of its distinctive character. Although Roger's policies toward the various groups under his rule are clearly pragmatic, he does appear to be a man of sincerely broad interests. He admires Arabic architecture, and his interest in the Greek church leads many of the Orthodox bishops who enjoy his patronage to feel that they might in fact have a chance at converting him to their right. However, Roger's placid domestic policy contrasts with his role as a fierce warrior chieftain along the borders of Norman territory, where guerrilla warfare rages between Roger's knights and Saracen resistors. The completion of Sicily's conquest is slowed by the fact that Roger must periodically return to Italy to help his brother Robert consolidate his rule on the mainland. In the 13 years following the Norman conquest of Palermo, Count Roger maintained pressure on the last remaining Arab holdouts in Sicily, while his brother, Duke Robert, was occupied with affairs on mainland Italy. Roger lacked the men to launch any large-scale invasions of Muslim territory. During this period, there were few pitched battles, but many raids and counter-raids in which small, swift bands of horsemen executed quick attacks against borderland towns and fortresses. Throughout these grueling struggles, both sides demonstrated remarkable bravery. But gradually, the Arabs were losing ground, while Norman power was increasing. In 1077, Count Roger subdued the last remaining Muslim strongholds in western Sicily. The Normans besieged Trapani. Roger's son Jordan led a surprise raid on the grassy promontory where the defenders kept their sheep and cattle, and thus with a single stroke deprived the town of its main food source. Trapani's garrison surrendered, marking a significant loss for Sicily's Muslims. Next, the well-positioned castle of Erice capitulated. Two years later, in 1079, the Emir of Tormina, 
whose city was by now encircled by almost two dozen Norman fortresses, found himself also facing a strong naval blockade. He realized that further resistance was futile and surrendered to the Christians. Tormina's fall was followed by the capitulation of the remaining strongholds in the Etna region. At the close of 1079, the entirety of Sicily, north of the agrigento catania line, with the exception of the powerful fortress of Enna, was now in Norman hands. Next, Count Roger's advance was briefly halted. The Normans had to deal with a few minor Saracen uprisings in 1080. And in 1081, Roger was called on to assist his brother Robert in Italy. Robert Giscard was about to launch his massive expedition against the Byzantine Empire. And during his absence, he wanted his brother to rule as regent in Apulia. Although Roger must have found it frustrating to be called away from his domains in Sicily, as usual, he was happy to help his brother, for he well understood that his own position in Sicily was reliant upon the security and prosperity of Robert's state in southern Italy. During his first few weeks in Italy, Roger was alarmed to receive news that back in Sicily, Ibn Alwardi, the Emir of Syracuse, called Bernavert by the Norman chronicler Geoffrey of Molitera, had managed to capture Catania. However, Roger's son, Jordan, assembled 160 horsemen, struck back against Ibn Alwardi, and recaptured Catania. By the time Roger returned to Sicily, all was in order, but he intended to take action to prevent the possibility of further revolts. Over the winter, Roger dedicated his time to bolstering the defenses of Messina, which he considered to be the key stronghold of Sicily. But in the spring of 1082, Roger was once again summoned by his brother Robert to help deal with pressing matters in Italy. It was during this period of Roger's absence in the summer of 1083 that the Count's own son, Jordan, gathered around himself a band of discontented knights and raised the standard of rebellion against his own father. Jordan seized a couple of castles, then advanced on Troina, where his father kept his treasure. Roger hurried back to Sicily to find that the revolt showed little potential for success, but rather, the real danger was that Jordan and his companions might desert to the Muslims. Initially, Roger feigned mercy, acting as though he were totally untroubled by the whole affair. This posturing worked, and Jordan and his co-conspirators gave themselves up to Roger, believing they would be pardoned. The Count immediately threw them all into prison. Jordan's 12 main accomplices were blinded, while Jordan himself languished in prison for days, waiting to receive a similar punishment. At last, Roger issued a pardon for his son. Jordan knelt at his father's feet and swore his loyalty. And indeed, he served Roger faithfully for the remainder of his life. This was the last time the great count would ever again be troubled by internal disloyalty in Sicily. Meanwhile, Ibn Alwardi, the Emir of Syracuse, had been biding his time, waiting for the chance to strike back against the Normans. During the summer of 1084, he made his move, launching a series of naval raids against the towns of the Calabrian coast. At Reggio, the Saracens destroyed two churches, but worst of all, Ibn al-Wardi's men attacked the convent of the Mother of God at Rocca de Asino. Here, they captured all of the nuns and carried them back to the Emir's harem. If Ibn al-Wardi was trying to rouse a thirst for vengeance among the Christians, he certainly succeeded. 
In fact, the emir was more interested in rousing the ardor of his own Muslim subjects, for he knew that only a fiery spirit of resistance would give him any chance of defying the Normans. News of the treatment of the nuns spread rapidly, and soon Roger's followers were clamoring for a decisive counterattack against the Saracens. Immediately, Roger began to prepare for what would prove to be one of the biggest military campaigns of his life. For a solid winter and spring, Count Roger of Sicily was occupied making preparations for a major campaign against Arab Syracuse. By May 1085, the great Norman Count was ready. On Wednesday, the 20th of the month, he launched his fleet from Messina. By nightfall, he reached Tormina, and the following day he passed Catania. By Friday the 22nd, Roger anchored his fleet roughly 15 miles north of Syracuse. Here the Count rendezvoused with his land army, including the ever-crucial Norman cavalry, which was led by his son, Jordan. Roger's forces were now positioned for the attack. Before he did anything else, the Count decided to conduct a thorough reconnaissance of Syracuse. He dispatched a band of 12 Arabic-speaking Sicilians, possibly converted Saracens, to slip into the city. Under cover of darkness, the 12 spies traveled by ship into the enemy harbor, passing their vessel off as a local craft. The band of intruders managed to get a good look at the fleet of Ibn al-Wardi, the emir of Syracuse. By Sunday, they returned to Count Roger's camp with detailed information about the size and strength of the emir's forces. Roger now felt prepared to launch his attack. On a barren piece of coastline, the Count's army gathered together to confess their sins and hear mass. The clergy blessed the soldiers and their cause. Then, at nightfall, the Norman forces moved on Syracuse. At sunrise, the battle began in the same waters where some 15 centuries prior, the fleet of Syracuse defeated the Athenian navy. As the Norman vessels advanced, their crossbowmen began to inflict damage on Ibn al-Wardi's fleet. The Christians with their crossbows were simply out shooting the Muslim archers. Ibn al-Wardi realized that he would quickly lose this battle if he did not move in to closely engage his enemies. The Muslim ships advanced through a hail of arrows. The emir's own ship was in the lead and Ibn al-Wardi bravely commanded his sailors to drive straight for Count Roger's flagship. The emir himself was wounded by an enemy javelin, but he continued to take part in the battle, determined to inspire his men. As the Muslim fleet came right up against the Norman line, the emir tried to board an enemy vessel, but he tripped or stumbled in some way and fell into the sea. Under the weight of his armor, Ibn al-Wardi drowned, and with him any remaining hope of Muslim resistance against Norman domination of Sicily. With their bold emir suddenly killed, the Muslim soldiers and sailors suffered a disastrous loss of morale. Most of the Saracen ships were captured then and there by the Normans, while the others retreated to the harbor of Syracuse. But by now, Jordan and the land army had thoroughly entrenched themselves before the land walls of Syracuse. The city was surrounded. A lengthy siege began. All through the summer, the Muslim defenders of Syracuse tried to appease Count Roger. They released to him all their Christian prisoners, including the nuns who had been abducted from Calabria the previous year. But Roger would be satisfied by nothing but unconditional surrender. Finally, in October, 
Ibn al-Wardi's widow and son, along with the leading Saracens of Syracuse, snuck out of the city and fled by ship to Noto in the south. This brought an end to the siege. The Muslims of Syracuse, abandoned by their leaders and bereft of their heroic emir, surrendered. Count Roger was now ruler of Syracuse. With Ibn al-Wardi gone, there was no one left with the zeal to lead the resistance against the Normans. And indeed, there was now little enough left of Muslim Sicily. A few fortresses were still held by the Saracens, but these could only survive so long as Count Roger was preoccupied with other affairs. Eventually, he would turn his attention to their reduction, and then they must surely fall. But with his great triumph at Syracuse completed, Roger was indeed distracted by other affairs. His brother, Robert Giscard, had died, and Roger's presence was required in Italy to help settle the succession. But by the spring of 1086, Roger was back in Sicily and resumed the final stages of the conquest. In April, his army besieged Agrigento, which fell to the Normans in July. Among the prisoners taken were the wife and children of Ibn Hamid, ruler of Enna. Although he lacked the fiery spirit of Ibn al-Wardi, Ibn Hamid was nevertheless the last important Saracen lord on Sicily. And his fortress of Enna, though now effectively surrounded and isolated, was nevertheless one of the most formidable strong points on the island. Roger, eager to avoid a costly siege, decided to use his distinguished captives to his full advantage. Roger spent the remainder of the year consolidating his new conquests and rebuilding the fortifications of Agrigento. Meanwhile, he left Ibn Hamad to worry over the fate of his wife and children. Then, in early 1087, Roger, accompanied by 100 Norman knights, showed up in front of the towering and virtually impregnable Enna, and invited Ibn Hamad to parley with him in his war tent. Roger found the emir to be totally agreeable. Ibn Hamad wanted to surrender to the Normans, but he was concerned about certain factions within Enna, which he believed might revolt and try to hold the city to the death. Roger assured Ibn Hamid that he was sympathetic to this problem and proposed a solution to which the emir happily agreed. Thus, a plan having been set in place, Roger and his men simply departed, a development that surely must have surprised Enna's Saracen defenders. A few days later, Ibn Hamid announced to his troops that they were departing on an expedition and, in accordance with the plan he devised with the Normans, the emir marched his entourage out of their fortress and into a narrow defile. Here, Count Roger surrounded them with a large Norman army. Ibn Hamid, again according to plan, promptly surrendered. And that easily, the Normans captured the Saracen force that would have resisted them at Enna. Ibn Hamid then handed his city over to Roger. And so, the final formidable Muslim stronghold in Sicily passed into Norman hands. Roger next reunited Ibn Hamid with his wife and children, who had been well treated in Norman custody. The former emir then requested baptism, and then, as a newly converted Christian, retired to an estate in Calabria, provided, of course, by Roger. Thus, things ended peaceably enough for the last dispossessed Muslim lord of Sicily. At this point, only two Saracen castles remained on the southern end of Sicily, Utera and Noto, neither of which was equipped to withstand much attention from the Normans. Utera surrendered the following year, in 1088, shortly after Roger entertained Pope Urban II, who visited Sicily that year. Noto, 
clinging to the southernmost tip of Sicily, held out for a few more years while Roger was preoccupied with the conflict between his brother Robert Giscard's heirs, Bohemond and Roger Borza. However, in 1091, Noto voluntarily surrendered, and so ended any trace of Muslim rule on Sicily. To further bolster his position, Roger led an expedition to Malta, which also surrendered without a fight. The Norman conquest of Sicily was complete. Sicily as a whole was once again within the fold of Christendom, and this dramatically impacted the balance of power on the Mediterranean. Islam no longer dominated the sea, and Italy was now safe from Saracen pirates. The conquest of Sicily was one of the key manifestations of the rising power of the Latin West. All during the Norman expansion across Sicily, the popes had been enthusiastic supporters and had extended spiritual benefits to the conquerors that helped to lay the groundwork for crusade ideology.